Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. Poland was once a model of democracy in Eastern Europe. In the 1980s, its solidarity trade union movement played a key role in the collapse of Soviet influence in the region. In 1999, it was the first group, it was among the first group of former Soviet bloc states to join NATO. Five years later, it became a full member of the European Union. Fueled by trade and investment from Germany and other EU nations, its economy grew steadily, even through the financial crisis of 2008. But since 2015, there have been some big changes. That's when a populist right-wing party called the Law and Justice Party, or PIS, won both the presidency and a majority in the lower house of Poland's parliament. Law and Justice has sought to force dozens of senior judges from the judiciary, shunned refugees, and advanced a law critics say would criminalize the discussion of Polish participation in the Holocaust. Freedom of expression groups accuse the government of systematically undermining the press by politicizing public broadcasters and pursuing lawsuits against critical journalists. All this has greatly strained Poland's ties with the EU, which has moved to sanction Poland over the decline of the rule of law in the country. So on this edition of Global Journalist, a look at challenges to democracy in Poland. In a few minutes, we'll bring in some journalists who have been tracking this issue closely. But first, we're going to talk to Jan Czenski in Brussels. He's a senior policy editor at Politico Europe and was previously a Warsaw-based correspondent for The Economist and The Financial Times. His uh, recent book is called Startup Poland. Jan, welcome. Thanks very much for having me. Well, uh, talk to us just a little bit about this far-right populist party that has been making some big changes in Poland. Help us just to understand uh, how, how it's grown and what its roots are. Um, its roots are in uh, what you mentioned at the beginning, uh, in solidarity. It's part of that sort of broader anti-communist movement from the 1980s. Um, the thing with uh, law and justice is that its leader, uh, Jaroslav Kaczynski, who is a uh, simple member of parliament but is the de facto ruler of the country, has always thought that the 1989 transformation that saw the end of communist rule was fatally flawed, that what should have happened was uh, prosecution, uh, exclusion of the uh, of the former communists from power, and uh, sort of a wholesale rebuilding of the country at that point. So he's, for decades, he's had a fundament, fundamental disagreement with the makeup of the country, and uh, that the so what he's trying to do now is essentially go back to 1980, uh, 1989 and rebuild the country from scratch, creating new elites, new businesses new court structures, uh, the feeling that, that the Poland that has existed for the last 30 years is fundamentally illegitimate and needs to be deeply changed. Well, one of the metaphors that I've heard people use when they talk about the changes that have taken place in Poland over the last couple of years is that it's like uh, people, the law and justice is piling uh, pebbles one on top of another until you have sort of this mountain uh, that is in effect a large change in from where Poland was a, a few years ago. Can you talk to us just a little bit about, you know, what all these little changes have been? The the biggest uh, change is in, uh, in the court system. Uh, Polish courts traditionally haven't been enormously effective. They've been kind of slow. Uh, they're, 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 they haven't been very well managed. Um, this, the Law and Justice Party was in power very briefly from 2005 to 2007, and many of the party's more radical ideas were stopped by the courts. And so uh, this time around, Kaczynski, immediately after they, uh, they won the elections in late 2015, uh, tackle the courts. Uh, taking the, the the model from Hungary, they saw that you can't push through the kind of radical uh, societal change that they want to do if you uh, leave the court system intact. And so the, uh, the, the effort has been to uh, remove inconvenient judges, to put in uh, party loyalists into, into senior judicial positions, and to very uh, overtly bring the court system under the control of the ruling party. Well, we're going to talk about the court system more a little later in the program. But one of the things I want to ask you about as well is that it does seem like there is uh, sort of the idea of Polish identity is also important to the law and justice party. And even the way that Poles talk about uh, what happened during the Second World War has become sort of a key issue for them. Talk to us a bit about the about that. There was this controversial law about uh, I think they call it the death camp law that was passed earlier this year. 
Yeah, the, the, this, uh, the Law and Justice Party, uh, its popularity, and it's enormously popular in the country right now, rests on two main foundations. One is very generous uh, uh, social, pro social welfare programs, reversing the retirement age, uh, baby bonuses, that sort of thing. The other one is... I'm sorry, baby it, bonuses. So these are government payments for having, yeah, a, having a child or having a second child then? Second and subsequent children, you get about $150 a month which in poorer parts of the country is a huge amount of money. If you have a large family, it's enough to dramatically change your economic situation. So that's, that's one pillar. The other pillar is a very strong appeal to national pride and nationalism. Um, they've uh, created this sort of cult around uh, guerrilla movements that fought the communists in the late 1940s and early 1950s. They were very unsuccessful and were quickly wiped out, but they've They've sort of created this this myth around these around these movements that that was the sort of essence of Polishness um, and of and a strong appeal to Polish pride. Um, they they feel that the last 30 years where Poland was economically quite successful, that it that there was this feeling that they were culturally uh, sort of Europe's little brother, that they uh, that they weren't able to be proud to be Poles. And so now there's there's an effort to um, appeal to Polish history to show that the that Poles have a lot to be proud of, that they're as good or better than the French or the Germans. And uh, and that's that's a big part of their their popularity. This so-called Holocaust law is part of that uh, that approach. What it what it do, did is it uh, criminalized um, uh, statements that attributed uh, uh, participation in the Holocaust to the Polish state or the Polish nation. Um, and many historians felt that, that what that did is that uh, made it more difficult to look at uh, more troubling aspects of, of Polish wartime history. Poland was obviously a victim of the war. It was occupied by the Germans. The Germans did terrible things in Poland. Some Poles were very brave and they, they tried to help uh, Jews. The vast majority of Poles were uh, for reasons of personal safety or ambivalence, did nothing one way or the other. And a minority, a small minority of Poles actively helped the Germans uh, kill Jews. But it's and this so discussion of those, that small minority of Poles that actively helped the Germans kill Jews that, th that was criminalized or there was an attempt to criminalize this. Not exactly. It's it, you, Theoretically, you can still talk about that sort of thing. What you can't do is attribute the crimes of these people to the Polish state, uh, which was an underground state at the time, or to the Polish nation at large. But it's, it's a very clumsy law, and it does uh, create the, the, the specter of Polish prosecutors sort of poring over uh, academic books or TV programs to decide, did what this person say violate the law or not? So it, it makes a very difficult part of history uh, subject to sort of political interpretation. And there was a huge blowback from Israel and the United States. They've changed the law a little bit so that the, 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 uh, the prison part of it has, has gone. But, but the law essentially still remains on the books. And it's, and it's a really big problem for, uh, for relations with, with many countries. Well, Jan Chainsky, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. This is Global Journalist on today's program. We're talking about Poland's right-wing populist government, a government critics say is undermining the rule of law in a country that had been a model for democracy in Eastern Europe. We just spoke with Jan Chainsky of Politico Europe. To broaden our discussion now, we're going to bring in three other journalists who have reported on Poland extensively. Joining us from Warsaw is Christian Davies. He's a correspondent in Poland for The Guardian. Christian, welcome. Hi. Also with us in London is Paul Waldy. He's a European correspondent for Canada's Globe and Mail newspaper. Paul, welcome to the show. And on the line from New York is Hannah Kozlowska. She's a correspondent for the online news outlet Quartz and previously reported from Poland for the New York Times and the magazine Poland Today. Hannah, welcome. Hi. Well, Christian, let me start with you. We just heard Jan, uh, Jan Chainsky talking about um, the controversy around this death camps law in Poland. I think another element uh, of this uh, th that along the same theme is that there have been some very large uh, far right marches in Poland, especially uh, around Poland's Independence Day in November. Talk to us just a little bit about the march uh, last year. 
Um, well, it's interesting. This march has been uh, organized by far-right parties for uh, about the last eight to ten years, uh, and it's grown in scale uh, every year. Uh, but it only reached international attention last year, which is interesting because uh, in 2016, for example, it was equally big uh, and with the same kind of events, but it didn't get very much attention. Uh, and I think this is partly because it feeds into uh, more of a global fear of the rise of the far right, or at least in the, uh, in the Western world. I think it's important to say that Law and Justice is not a far right party itself. Um, but it defines itself against uh, liberal values and what it regards as unacceptable liberal political correctness. And so the far right play a role of provoking um, moderates and liberals uh, and the left. Uh, and law and justice is able to, uh, to portray itself um, as somehow a, a party that protects patriots, even if they may go a little bit far or they may express themselves in an uh, uncomfortable way. Uh, they, they like to think of themselves as them and the uh, patriots on one side and everyone else on the other. And, and we should so be clear that, right that in this big march in November, I think there were banners that said Europe must be white, pray for an Islamic holocaust. Uh, these, these were skinheads. Uh, some of the people that marched were skinheads, neo-Nazis, obviously, you know, sort of far out of the mainstream. Uh, the, the Pray for the Islamic Holocaust banner was in a different city at a different time. That was, um, But yes, there, there were um, uh, extremely uh, nasty banners. The problem in Poland is that, unlike in a lot of uh, Western countries, there isn't much of a, a real distinction between the right and the far right, uh, and between nationalism uh, and patriotism. And that means you get a lot of different kinds of people all mixing together. Um, so what some people would say with that march is, oh, the far right was only one part of it, uh, and the rest of it were normal patriots going about their business. And uh, the problem is it's very hard to uh, disaggregate those different uh, movements. The problem is uh, that people who are not uh, on the far right uh, don't seem to have a problem with attending a march organized by and with the participation of uh, those uh, very dangerous movements. Well, Paul Waldi, if I could turn this to you, then we heard Jan Chainsky talking a bit about the changes in the judi Poland's judicial system. Explain to us just a little bit about exactly what the Law and Justice Party was trying to do and what the response of the European Union has been. Sure. I mean, what they've been trying to do is kind of a continuum of what they've been trying to do since they got into power in 2015. And that is kind of you know, reorganize a lot of the public institutions in the way they see them. And of course, you've you just heard a lot of discussion about how law and justice is very keen to uh, protect the, the national identity. They're, they're a very nationalist party, I, I would argue, as opposed to maybe a far right party. There's a lot of parties further right than them, believe me, that are even more extreme. With the judiciary, the, their argument has always been that the judiciary is full of old communists. It, it, it's been been badly managed and badly run for years because it's stacked with communists. And the whole thing, and you heard it before, is Zinsky's whole thing is to get away from this kind of communist era. And he views the courts as part of that era. Now, the problem is what they've done is basically, in, in the eyes of a lot of people... But I mean, I mean this is the communist era. Is, it's almost 30 years ago now. Yeah, but a lot of these judges have been around that long. I mean, Lincoln, think about judges in the Supreme Court in, in the United States. They're around for a very long time. And he argues that these judges are holdovers from that era. They've been on the courts for a long time, particularly the Supreme Court, and they've got to get, be gotten rid of. Now, the, the, the issue for the EU and a lot of others is the way they're going about getting rid of these people, and that is politicizing the court. They're effectively putting in, you know, watchdogs, and they're putting in their own appointment process. And basically, the argument against them is that they are making their own appointees to the court that will be beholden to the party. And that's caused a major problem with the European Union. It's also beginning to cause problems for foreign investors, companies looking to invest in Poland, are leery about the court system now, even more than they were before, partly because of the reforms, but also because the judges, many judges, are resisting these changes and are refusing to quit, are refusing to hear cases, and the, and the whole legal system there is in a real turmoil. So this is a big fraction, this is a big problem for Poland and the EU. Well, Anna Kozlowska, I want to ask you about some changes to the press and the media there in Poland. We mentioned during the introduction that there have been concerns that the public media has been politicized there. There's also been government pressure on the private press. Talk to us just a bit about that. Sure. Um, so the one of the largest TV stations is Telewizja Polska, the government-run state 
TV station, which has historically been pretty neutral, or at least in the 25 years, uh, uh, 20 plus years uh, uh, after the transformation. But with peace coming into power, um, it's become basically a propaganda machine. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it essentially is spreading what we like to call fake news, right, or misinformation. Um, it's become just, uh, you know... Can, can uh, you give us an example? Um, uh, it's... It, it, uh, it's you know it's um uh it's on the side of the the government party constantly and it misrepresents words of the opposition um it, you know it's it's essentially become an instrument of power okay so sort of in the same way it sounds like it's similar to the way that russia television rt uh sort of promotes uh the russian government's ideology then certainly certainly Good. And what about what about for the private pass? Obviously, Poland has, uh, it, you know, it has a robust media system there, a variety of newspapers, magazines, online outlets. Are, are those journalists also coming under pressure? Uh, they are, I would say. But, you know, at the same time, um, they are really trying to hold those in power accountable. And, and uh, I don't know, I've, I feel like I've noticed um, journalists becoming more activists recently. Um, for sure, but there are also new investigative outlets that have pop up, um, and you know they're they're really doing the necessary work uh, there. But but certainly there there have there has been there have been lawsuits um, uh, from the government side, and, and and there's definitely been pressure, and their access to politicians has been limited as well. Um, at certain points, journalists weren't even allowed into the parliament. Um, so 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 yeah, the 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 press is definitely in danger, I would say. Well, Christian Davies, if I could, I could turn this back to you, soon after the Law and Justice Party uh, won the election a couple years ago, you wrote an article for The Guardian headline, The Conspiracy Theorists Who Have Taken Over Poland. What What are some of the conspiracy theories that law and justice has advanced? Uh, well, uh, as Jan was saying, that. Um, Yaroslav Kaczynski's uh, argument that uh, the state is somehow still controlled by former communists uh, was developed in 1989 when, uh, and 1990 when uh, he was on the fringes of the solidarity uh, elite. Um, and that was an argument which uh, had, uh, of course, some uh, truth in the, uh, in the early 90s, in the 90s, because uh, Poland's transition was a compromise, uh, and it didn't uh, punish former communists and so on. Mm -hmm. But the more that time has gone on, uh, the less uh, uh, credible, the less connection to reality it has, because it's been 30 years now. Um, what everyone knows in Poland is that across all political parties, uh, there are former communists. There are many former communists in law and justice. In fact, one of the uh, main people in law and justice uh, helping with the so-called decommunization uh, of the justice system is himself a former communist prosecutor. So the conspiracy theory is that uh, they are against all the communists and all the communists are against them. And what it allows them to do is to say that anyone who is against them is de facto uh, somehow a communist sympathizer, whether they had any connection with uh, communism or not. And a lot of uh, oppositionists were in, um, are in other parties. Uh, um, the main opposition party is made up majority of ex-solidarity activists as well. Um, so uh, that is the, sort of the big lie at the center of it. Uh, and then when your political movement is constructed on one uh, large conspiracy theory, uh, then you have an interest in encouraging many other conspiracy theories um, uh, to, to support it. So uh, one, one lie tends to last, uh, lead to another. A reminder that you're tuned into Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's program, we're talking about Poland's populist law and justice government, which critics say is undermining democracy and the rule of law in Eastern Europe. We're joined by Christian Davies of The Guardian, Paul Waldi of The Globe and Mail, and Hannah Kozlowska of Quartz. If you're interested in more Global Journalists, check us out online at globaljournalist.org. There you can find our archives and additional coverage of underreported international news and press freedom issues. You can also like us on Facebook, where we live stream. Follow us on Twitter, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, or see our videocast on YouTube. Paul Waldi, I want to pick up on the issue of anti-immigrant sentiment uh, in Poland. That also seems to be uh, that also seems to be a part of the law and justice movement. Talk to us a little bit about how that applies in Poland, because correct me if I'm wrong. Poland actually has had relatively 
little uh, immigration uh, compared with its neighboring neighboring European countries. Yeah, I mean, they have. They, they certainly have, don't have any tradition of immigration from places like North Africa or the Middle East. Uh, however, in fairness to, to, to Poland and, and the, the attack on it for being anti-immigration, they do deal with an awful lot of immigration from Ukraine and a lot of people coming from Ukraine because of the troubles in that country that would be considered probably economic migrants or even refugees in other countries. So they do have a real issue uh, on the Ukrainian border, but they have not been, you know, taking in a lot of immigrants from North Africa or the Middle East or elsewhere. And that's partly be reflects the history and the culture and the traditions there. They're not used to that kind of immigration. Law and justice has been one of the leading, you know, countries in the EU against the, the EU's migration policy. They've kind of teamed up with Hungary and others to sort of hit back at what the EU wants to do. They would argue they're winning that battle because the EU appears to be backing off. Certainly Germany's backing off. Now with a new government in Italy, uh, they're clearly uh, on side with a lot of what Poland and what Hungary want to do. And another key part of this whole thing is some of the personalities involved. I mean, you got to remember that the guy, one of the leading figures in the European Union right now is Donald Tusk. He's a former president of Poland. He's the guy that, you know, that law and justice can't stand. He's the guy that represented all of the establishment, all of the, the bad things, they would argue, that happened to Poland after it joined the EU. And now you've got Jaros, uh, Jer uh, Kaczynski and his group in power. And Kaczynski, you know, he's also an interesting character. He had a, a brother who died in a plane crash. And he's been in mourning for him forever. So there's a lot of really interesting personal politics behind a lot of this. And that sort of feeds into this kind of tension with the EU on issues like immigration. Well, Anna Kozlowska, uh, we heard Paul talking about some of this tension within the EU. The EU has been taking some uh, measures. I think it's called an Article 7 process, which could eventually lead to Poland losing its voting rights uh, within the European Union. I mean, is there any talk that Poland could exit the EU in, in the same way the United Kingdom uh, has done or is planning yeah, to? There's been a poll exit. The idea has been floated by a government official who later backtracked. Um, of course, this is very difficult because Poland has benefited enormously from EU funds. Um, however, it's a very useful propaganda tool to be, you know, to be creating a, yet another enemy. So the EU has become, um, a, you know, an enemy that that peace, law, and justice is is using as well. So even recently. Um, President Andrzej Duda called it the EU an imaginary community, um, eliciting a, a pretty big outcry. I just want to take one issue with what Paul was saying about uh, Ukrainians. So I don't know if I would characterize it uh, as an issue, maybe because they are supplying a labor force uh, in Poland. Um, and when, when you're in Poland right now, all of your Uber drivers or your cashiers are Ukrainian right now. So it's um, it, a lot of people would argue that it's they're actually a boost to the economy. Well, Christian Davies, if we could just pick up on this point then as well about the popularity of the Law and Justice Party. One thing uh, that I think is a little bit striking, at least for Americans, is that they do seem to have uh, quite strong support from young people um, uh, in Poland. In the U.S., when we look at sort of the uh, right wing populist supporters of President Trump, we often think that it's many older Americans. So it seems like the demographics are a little different in Poland. Talk to us about that. Uh, it's an interesting phenomenon. As you say, in a lot of countries, people say, well, the uh, young people are the future. Um, there was a newspaper column published in one of the main liberal newspapers in Poland recently in which the columnist says, why are no young people on the streets protesting with us? And it is very interesting that most of the opposition protests are middle-aged uh, people, and uh, particularly women uh, at the age of 60 uh, and above. And um, you've definitely seen that 10 years ago, uh, young Poles would vote overwhelming for liberal pro-European parties, and now they vote for nationalistic uh, um, uh, uh, nationalistic parties instead. Uh, it's a complicated issue, but it seems that many young people uh, feel uh, frustrated uh, in the um, uh, liberal labor market, uh, I mean an economically liberal labor market, um, and uh, peace and other right-wing parties uh, offer them a kind of economic nationalism, which they feel protects them. Sure, but as, as Anna has mentioned, I mean, Poland has benefited enormously, it seems, from being part of the European Union, possibly more than almost any other country. Is it that people don't see the benefits of that, or is it that they had the expectations that Poland would have the living standards of France or Germany or, or, or wealthier countries, and that they, because they haven't achieved that, there's dissatisfaction? 
I think after 1989, in the 90s, uh, and, the, and the first entry of Poland as the EU in the early 2000s, uh, there was a, a younger generation that benefited, uh, benefited hugely, uh, and which now, and not improperly at all, but which now wields a lot of political uh, and economic power. And I think the generations above them, uh, who they kind of replaced, uh, are resentful of that, but they're also a generation below them who feel that they can't get ahead because the, the, the generation ahead of them uh, has benefited so much. And so what you get is a, a middle class and middle aged base for the pro-European liberal opposition, uh, and a lot of young people who are working uh, relatively insecure contracts, part-time work, not with, uh, uh, not with a lot of economic security, who um, are um, uh, very attracted to parties that offer them uh, economic and, uh, nationalism mixed with a kind of crude patriotism, which they find very attractive. So it, it depends. The country, of course, benefited as a whole hugely, but you've got to uh, break that down into different groups, different age groups, different generations. Well, Paul Waldy, talk to us just a little bit more about how Poland's economy has played a role in this. Oftentimes when people talk about the rise of populist movements, they're, they're attributed to economic anxiety or economic insecurity. As we mentioned during the introduction, Poland's economy has actually grown pretty strongly, even right through the financial crisis that, that felled a lot of other countries. Uh, yeah, even still, I mean, you're talking about a growth rate, 3%, pushing 4% at times. Now, it has slowed down a little bit in the last little while, but really, since Poland joined the EU, it's done nothing but grow, and it's probably at the higher end of the EU in terms of economic growth annually, and right through the, it didn't really feel the, the financial fall like anywhere else. Now, that being said, Poland is still quite a ways behind the sort of top EU countries like Germany, France, Britain, even Italy. It's not growing at the same levels. The per capita income isn't quite as high. So you're still seeing an exodus of people looking for work, leaving Poland, although a lot of them are starting to come back, and they're certainly leaving Britain uh, as well. That, I think, feeds into a lot of this as well, because you got to wonder how far the government can push this without starting to you know, make foreign investors a little bit leery. As I mentioned, the judicial changes are scaring some foreign investment. And I think the further they go with some of their reforms, the more they have to balance off what that will do in terms of the economy. And also, as you know, some of their neighbors slow down, they may slow down as well. So they're in a kind of an interesting position. The economy is doing very well, unemployment is very low, but they're still behind the EU leaders. And there's still sort of, there's an awful lot of regional disparity in Poland, lots, an awful lot of inequality that they're going to have to address, aging population, a lot of the same challenges that the rest of the EU has. Well, we're out of time for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute of the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Jan Chainsky, Paul Waldy, Hannah Kozlowska, and Christian Davies. Our assistant producers this week are Nikki Bram and Megan Smaltz. Jan Chi Chu is supervising producer, and Maggie Duncan is visual editor. Aaron Hay is audio engineer. Travis McMillan is director. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.